Remember arcades? That place you'd go with your friends after school and spend pockets full of quarters on Street Fighter and Galaga? Is that before your time? Well, that's okay. Because remnants of the arcade have made their way into our homes. And no, I'm not talking about the Street Fighter cabinet in your uncle's man cave. I'm talking about controllers. Specifically, the joystick and buttons used across virtually all fighting games. Almost unchanged in the last 30 years, this setup has moved from giant machines to portable gamepads. And today, we're going to be exploring the history of the fight stick. To understand how we went from this to this, let's first take a look at how arcade cabinets evolved over the years. Our tale begins in 1967, when Ralph H. Baer, inventor of the Magnavox Odyssey, created the first video game joystick, which could control the position of a point of light displayed on a screen. Though not all that impressive, two years later, in 1969, the same year we walked on the moon, Sega released the first game that utilized this new joystick technology, Missile. The game featured a two-way joystick used to control the flight path of the missile either left or right, as well as a fire button to shoot the missile. In 1973, Taito released Astro Race, which featured a more complex joystick which had four directions rather than two. Now you could go left, right, and up and down, making it possible for games like Pac-Man to be developed. Then, in 1975, Western Gun was released, which utilized an eight-way joystick, allowing for the cardinal directions to be inputted, plus one stop in between. Keep this in mind, as the eight-way joystick will be vital for fight sticks down the road. Over the next 10 years, technology kept improving at a steady rate. The world would change in May 1984, with the release of Karate Champ. One of the first fighting games ever made, Karate Champ is credited with popularizing the one versus one fighting game genre. Though archaic in its use of two four-directional joysticks, Karate Champ was the first time that two players could set up next to each other and battle it out in a 2D fighting game. In the coming years, these types of fighting games would become one of the most popular genres in the arcade. Also released in 1984, ER Kung Fu would introduce several staples of the genre. Special moves, high jumps, and a health meter system that is pretty much universal today. Other games would continue to iterate and experiment with the formula, but it was in 1987, with the release of Capcom Street Fighter, that everything would change. The game had a lot going for it. A diverse cast of characters, state-of-the-art graphics, and it introduced command inputs to perform special moves, like doing a quarter circle to shoot a Hadouken. While the controls were clunky compared to later games, the core gameplay of Street Fighter is the template by which all other fighting games have been made. However, for the purpose of this video, Street Fighter's most important contribution to the fighting game genre was the standardization of its control scheme. One eight-directional joystick, six buttons, three for punches, three for kicks. Over the next few years, more and more fighting games would be released. Street Fighter II, released in 1991, featured better button scanning technology, frame buffers, and the ability to chain hits into combos. SNK's Fatal Fury and Midway Games' Mortal Kombat further elevated the popularity of the fighting game genre, and by the mid-1990s, there were a diverse selection of fighting games to choose from. But one thing they all shared was the eight-way joystick and six-button control scheme, a control scheme that we still use to this day. But just because different arcade cabinets use the same button layout doesn't mean that all arcade cabinets feel the same. A fighting game player who frequented the arcades of Akihabara in Tokyo would have different expectations compared to a regular of the Green Arcade in Seoul or a kid who hangs out at Chinatown Fair in New York City. The reason? Different regions use different components in their machines. And today, thanks to our friends at Canadian Joysticks, we have these different components to show you. The first thing you might notice is the different joystick shapes. Japanese cabinets have ball top joysticks while Korean and American ones have bat-top joysticks. And the reason for this goes beyond mere cosmetics. Japanese joysticks are designed to be used delicately, with the fingertips resting on top of the ball. They use light springs to keep the stick centered without too much deflection, and a square gate around the stick box to restrict how far you can go in any given direction. Because of this, users can manipulate the joystick with just a slight flick of the wrist, meticulously controlling their character in-game. Korean and American joysticks are designed to be used with more power, and the bat top allows players to wrap their fingers around the joystick and generate force with their entire arm. American joysticks are ungated, meaning that the stick can travel much further than Japanese sticks, and they use slightly stiffer springs to help the stick snap back to center more quickly. Korean sticks are also ungated, 
but use rubber grommets to keep the stick centered rather than a spring, which allows their sticks to snap back to neutral even faster than American ones. These differences, while minute, have a major impact on the feel of any given cabinet. Then there are buttons. If you're playing on a Japanese machine, the sanwa or samitsu buttons you're using are probably going to be flat or slightly convex. Here we have aftermark buttons, which are modeled after the American buttons manufactured by HAP. These are going to be concave and require you to push them a little bit further before they click. Some buttons are more sensitive than others, some are quieter, and the different types of plastic will feel different to your fingers. Once again, shout out to our friends at Canadian Joysticks for letting us these different parts to showcase. Over the years, these regional differences became a part of players' identities, and when fight sticks started being manufactured for home consoles, these differences followed players to their living rooms. But for a long time, arcades were the only place where you could get a full gaming experience. The graphics were better, the sticks and buttons felt better, and the atmosphere was something that couldn't be replicated anywhere else. The term Arcade Perfect was coined to describe a game that had been perfectly ported from an arcade cabinet to a home console. That means one-to-one -one visuals, one-to-one -one audio, and one-to-one -one gameplay. Suffice to say, for a long time, Arcade Perfect ports were nearly impossible to come by. So arcades were where hardcore gamers continued to flock. But that didn't stop game manufacturers from putting out some products that tried to mimic the arcade at home. Nintendo released the NES Advantage in 1987, the Neo Geo AES in 1990 came bundled with an arcade-style controller, and Sega manufactured this cute little six-button fight stick for the Dreamcast in 1998. There was clearly a desire for arcade-adjacent setups on home consoles. But most of what was being made by big companies wasn't quite good enough. So what were professional players to do? Well, build their own fight sticks, of course. Today, it's difficult to appreciate how difficult it was for the FGC to move from arcades to living rooms. For years, the arcade was a sacred place, a temple for competition, and one's skills could only be truly tested on a cabinet, not a home console. But slowly, as technology improved and Arcade Perfect ports were becoming more common, competitions began being hosted on consoles like the Dreamcast. Even Evo committed the sacrilege of shifting over. So the pros needed controllers that were up to snuff. Unfortunately, getting your hands on one isn't as easy as it sounds. While today, you're able to hop online and order a Mad Cats, Razer, or Hitbox controller in about 30 seconds, Back in the 90s and early 2000s, high-quality controllers had to either be imported from overseas or built from scratch in your garage. Welcome to the Ghetto Build Part 1. This is where Tao and Lin Nguyen come in. We had these uh, big old-school joysticks that uh, you used to be able to buy in Southern California. Uh, they were called MAS sticks. Tao and Lin Nguyen were the founders of multi-arcade system joysticks, better known as MAS sticks. Working out of their garage, Tao Nguyen hand-soldered every fight stick he built, meticulously creating console-ready controllers that emulated that arcade-perfect experience. As Nathaniel Chapman said in an interview with Kotaku, quote, Tao loved to talk with you while he was working, and in my experience, a lot of what he talked about was how shitty other controllers were. He was obsessed with quality. He hand-soldered everything and had several consoles running by his workstation to test inputs before he gave you back your stick. And these mass sticks were heavy. They took up space. They had to be put on tables or floors because they were too heavy to lay on your lap. And by God, did fighting game players love them. It was all that very legit heavy feel, you know, they were they were great. And it was, uh, it was for, uh, they made it for all sorts of different systems, but first one was just for Dreamcast. If you wanted something made, you could call up the new ends and specify exactly what you wanted. If you needed custom pieces for your own fight stick, you could drive to their house and pick up the parts directly. It was grassroots. It was organic. It was the FGC personified. For years, MOS controllers were used by some of the best North American players of all time. At EVO 2004, during the same set where EVO Moment 37 happened, Justin Wong was using a MOS stick. In the MVC2 grudge match at EVO 2006 between Duck Du and Sanford Kelly, both players are using MOS sticks. Alex Valle refers to Tao Nguyen as, quote, the original FGC blacksmith saying that their passion in creating arcade-perfect fight sticks in the 90s is how the early fighting game community was able to train at home. Without the homebrewed fight sticks, transitioning from the arcades to home consoles would have been nearly impossible. But by the end of the 2000s, the days of garage builds were coming to an end, and fighting games were about to undergo an industrial revolution, all thanks to the return of that perennial classic, Street Fighter IV. It was 2008, 
and coinciding with the release of Street Fighter 4, an unlikely hero would begin manufacturing top-of-the-line fight sticks. Mad Cats. Yeah, the company that made this. My eyes! The company that made you dread going over to your cousin's house because they always made you use that one controller with the crazy analog stick. That Mad Cats. But when it came to fight sticks, they decided they weren't messing around. Signing a contract with Capcom, Mad Cats began producing the Street Fighter 4 Fight Stick Tournament Edition, better known as TE or TE1 for short. Using top-of-the-line Sanwa parts, the TE1 holds up to this day for its durability and responsiveness. Since it was compatible with Sanwa parts, and because Mad Cats color-coded all of their wiring, and didn't require a soldering gun to switch out new parts, the controller was a modder's dream. You could replace the stick, the buttons, everything, and you didn't need technical knowledge to do so. So whatever you like, this can be the home for the ultimate Street Fighter experience. The TE1 was kind of a jumping off point for the fight stick industry in general, and pro players took notice. Hori, Kanba, even Razer, professionally manufactured fight sticks were being used to win some of the biggest tournaments in the world, and Mad Cats was top of the line. Everyone from Jay Wong to Daigo was using them. Gone were the days of attending tournaments with a screwdriver and soldering pen in case one of your buttons stopped working. The age of esports was upon us. But as younger players came into the scene, the perception of fight sticks being the only true way to play fighting games started to diminish. Players were winning EVOs with PS1 controllers. Young guns like Punk and Sonic Fox were showing that gamepads could be used to immense success. And people were experimenting with new builds that totally changed the nature of the fight stick. One such example is the hitbox. The idea behind the hitbox is be the best for fighting games. Really felt that instead of using like a joystick, we wanted to use arcade buttons. You would have better control over the directional inputs, which is really key for fighting games. Designed to be more ergonomic and responsive, the hitbox offers an alternative way to play fighting games for those who are uncomfortable using the traditional joystick and button combo. One of its greatest strengths is just literally that basic leverage and just if you learn how to you can just use walking forward and blocking and getting that little bit of spacing more and that little bit of speed, it can really just make the difference in games. A lot of people kind of don't know this, but even back in 2010, like if you were a pad player, it was kind of poo-pooed <laughs> per se. And so like, you know, those guys were getting their feet and still trying to establish that pad was a legit way to play in the scene. And then we popped up. <laughs> It's like, oh, well, we're doing it with some buttons. We went to uh, SoCal Regionals 2010 or something like that with our prototypes that we were goofing around with at the time. And we would get looks of sheer, like, disgust from people or sheer amazement, you know? And it was never too much in the middle. It was like, oh, what are you doing? Or just like, how do you do that? Whether for health reasons or just personal preference, there's a growing wave of players who are opting for a four-button WASD configuration in lieu of a ball and stick. Most notably, Daigo Umahara, the beast himself, made the switch to using a hitbox controller, and several other top competitors in Japan have followed suit. I remember we had a booth back then, and I believe Daigo came by and pressed a button one time, and I was just like, oh my god, Daigo touched it. Nine, ten years later, he touches it again and says, oh, maybe I can do this. And fight sticks are no longer confined to only 2D and 3D fighters. Some Smash players have been making the switch as well. Over the years, there were quite a few iterations of what a Smash Fight Stick might look like, but recently, a consensus has been reached. The Smash Box, developed by Hitbox, is the primary weapon of choice for most box players in Smash. Because Melee is an analog fighting game, there are way more possible inputs than most digital fighting games, so you might notice a few extra buttons. But at the end of the day, the classic arcade setup is evident even in the Smash Box. It was like, how do you do a tilt without an analog stick. And so immediately we were thinking, well, we were using buttons. And there's like, oh, well, you need a button that makes the button go only halfway. So um, yeah, over time, we just kind of tinkered with that for a lot of years. And eventually it, it turned into all of the ideas that like, oh yeah, this is a button you hold down, you get full, and then you press uh, this, you get halfway. And that those ideas evolved into the Smashbox over time. Today, fight sticks can range from $50 to $500, depending how much you want to flex on your opponent. Professional players mod the most minute details of their setups, and fight stick enthusiasts take their craft very, very seriously. As new innovations continue to come out, there's no telling where fight sticks might go next. But for a new generation, raised on gamepads and PlayStation controllers, the arcade will continue to live on as long as fighting games are still played on a fight stick. 
This video is made possible thanks to our wonderful patrons. Massive thank you to everyone on this list, and shout out to Jason B, Brendan QB, Foxy Mauve, Pachanas, Pin, Sierra Shampoo, Spartacus, and Yoshichi for being Platinum supporters. And an extra special shout out to Steven, Noodles, Marco, and Flight for being Diamond supporters. We appreciate all the support. If you want to talk to us, check out our Discord. If you want to support our channel and get info on unreleased videos, check out our Patreon. If you want to help us out in a different way, leaving a like, subscribing, and hitting the bell to stay up to date is also appreciated. My name is Jonah, thanks for watching.